Hey everybody, Paul Abernathy here. Welcome to another training exercise here at Electrical Code Academy Incorporated. If you're a member of our Fast Tracks program uh, and you're watching this video, again, thank you for joining our program. Today's lesson is going to be out of the Fast Tracks Purple program. So this is our grounding and bonding program. So we're going to be looking at that. So you'll get an inside peek uh, at some of the graphics and some of the things that are incorporated in the Purple program in our Fast Tracks. Now, the Fast Tracks is our trademark name. It's about a process of learning the National Electrical Code. And so we put that together, and all of our courses are color-coded. So if you're preparing for an electrical exam, it's the Fast Tracks Black. If you want to learn the code, just as maybe you're a project manager, an engineer, or something, you want a 30,000-foot view of the code, uh, all the broad categories, then you want to be in the Black program. Now, if you're really struggling with understanding all the terminologies when it comes to residential, and maybe you're transitioning from commercial to residential or whatnot, and you are post-licensing, means you're already a licensed electrician, but you really are struggling with all the nuances of the residential code because there's a lot of code requirements, and you want the RED program. So that's the Fast Tracks RED. If you're transitioning from residential and you're starting to do a little more commercial, uh, then you want the green program. That's the commercial program. So it specifically covers the code rules in a commercial environment. And of course, we have the blue program. That's industrial. So if you're transitioning into more of an industrial wiring atmosphere uh, with like variable frequency drives and things like that, then you want the blue. Of course, like today, we'll be looking at the purple, which is grounding and bonding. And never forget our yellow program, which is electrical theory. Okay, it's a great program if you want to learn parallel series, uh, magnetism, the atomic structure, uh, how electricity functions, and that's a great electricity one-on-one. You'll learn Ohm's Law, Watt's Law, all that good stuff. Okay, so that's all our programs. They're all available on our website. Just go to electricalcodeacademy.net, uh, but we have many other ways to get there. Master the NEC, uh, all different types of things, uh, theelectricalexam.com. Many ways, we have probably 60 URLs that all funnel to one location, okay? So rest assured, they're all owned by Electrical Code Academy. Now, down in the description, you'll have the links for those, and so check those links after you watch this video. All right, so what we're going to be talking about today is the grounding electrode system, and we're not going to do an overly long video today. We'll be breaking this down where we talk about each separate uh, item, each separate electrode, in a series, we're going to be talking about them in general today on this episode, right? So what we want to do is we're going to go on and uh, get started into that. All right. So if you've got your National Electrical Code book, you can follow along in this journey. Uh, we're going to be starting at 250.50, which talks about all of the electrodes and how they have to be connected together to form the grounding electrode system, okay? So we want to make sure that we uh, understand that as we get started. So if you've got your code book, I have my code book all handy. So I'm going here as well. And you see up on the screen, and I'll read it up here, and you follow along in your code book. And where necessary, guess what? We're going to be able to go to the code book. Okay, so it's a beautiful thing. Um, I finally am happy with my setups that I do my videos on. So um, it took a while, but we now have it all set up. And if you ever wondered what the scape is behind me, that is downtown Dallas, Texas. Okay? I'm just about 30 miles northeast of Dallas, and I don't go to Dallas very much, but I live up near McKinney, Texas, and that's where our academy is. All right, requirements. Number one, you can read it along. All grounding electrodes as described in 250.52A1 through A7 that are present at each building or structure served are required to be bonded together uh, to form the grounding electrode system. So I have a water pipe ground. If I have another, say I had a concrete and case electrode, if both of them were there, uh, and then for some reason somebody still wanted to put ground rods, they're not required, but if they did, I would have to make sure all that's tied together. And together, that's what forms our grounding electrode system. Follow me? All right, now, if none of the grounding electrodes exist, Okay, so let's say that A1 is the water pipe ground, A2 is the in-ground steel, like the I-beams, and we'll cover each of these in successive videos. And then, of course, the UFER, which is usually inherent with building construction, and that's what's unique about 250.52A1, 2, and 3. 
those are usually part of construction, right? The water pipe ground, you as an electrician, you don't control that. It's if they run the metal water pipe in contact with the earth for 10 feet in the ground as they come to the building, then you got a water pipe ground. Um, the uh, in-ground steel, if it's 10 foot of steel and it's driven into the earth or it's encased in concrete 10 foot in the earth, okay, 10 foot of that in-ground steel is in contact with the earth or concrete that's in the earth, then you have an electrode. That's part of construction. And then, of course, A3 was the Eufer, which is named after Herb Eufer. Uh, it's more accurately called a concrete encased electrode. That is either the rebar in the footer, at least 20 feet of it, or four-gauge copper in the footer, 20 feet of it. That constitutes a concrete encased electrode. Now, the rebar is inherent most of the time with construction. So A1, A2, and A3, they're all about construction. If they are not present, I mean, in other words, if they're not there, then I have to look at 250.52A4 through A8 as an alternative. And that's where we started getting into rods, pipes, plates, other made electro, other electrodes that are listed, like the chemical ones that we'll cover in these series. Uh, and, of course, you also have the ability to have a localized, like a well casing or something like that. Uh, but we'll look at each one of those because each one have their own little nuances. So we'll check them. And you also have a ring. You could do the ring method. Okay. Again, uh, a complete ring, but don't worry. We're going to cover all of these electrodes uh, as we move through this series piece by piece. Now, if you're in the grounding and bonding program that we have, you're going to get so much insight into all these things that you're going to walk away from the grounding and bonding program like, I am just so much better. I understand what objectionable current and what they mean and how we should try to avoid it. You'll understand the importance of why you don't have an improper case to neutral downstream. You know about it, but do you really know why? That's what this program is designed to do. So this isn't a licensing prep. The grounding and bonding purple program, this is post-licensing. This is where every electrician, in my opinion, needs to make sure that they have a better understanding of grounding and bonding. Because you know what? If it's done improperly, it is unsafe condition. It doesn't, uh, it just sits there and festers until it rears its ugly head down the road. And it can be because of improper uh, connections, improper grounding methods, improper installation of equipment grounding conductors, improper sizing, which won't have any effect until a ground fault takes place. And so, so many pieces that you have to be aware of in the electrical system. But when it comes to the grounding electrode system, tying everything together for lightning surges and transients and all those type of things are truly critical in understanding. So grounding and bonding is a key fundamental program, and it is one of our most popular programs. Okay? All right. So we're going to look at a discussion here. Um, also, I should read the exception. So the exception is letting you know that, you know what, if it's an existing building, and the, the concrete encased electrode uh, it exists, okay, on, on an existing building, then you know what? You're not required to include it as part of the grounding electrode system because if that meant that you would have to disturb the concrete, um, it could mess up the integrity of that structure's foundation and those footings. So, again, you had the exception that says, you know what, if it's an ex existing building, it might have, or you believe it has rebar, I don't need to chip down there and get to it, okay? I can treat it like it doesn't exist, but if that's the case, then I have to install an electrode in compliance with 250.52A4 through A8 in lieu of that, okay? So we're going to look at some things. So let's look at an illustration that we have. I can find my mouse here. lost my mouse. And I'll scroll down. So here's a good illustration. Make sure I get it as much as I can in here. All right. So in this illustration, we'll kind of look. So we kind of have all of them except for A8, which we'll look at when we get to that one. But, again, that is like um, localized, right? That is, would be an example of that would be metal. Uh, it says other local metal underground system or structures. Okay. Now it says... I'm going to read it because it's not covered here. 
It says other local metal underground systems or structures such as piping systems, except for gas piping, uh, underground tanks and underground metal well casings that are not bonded to the metal water pipe. Okay, so they're not part of the water pipe. They're their own thing. Then you know what? It might qualify as an electrode. Now, I will tell you with A8, you need to always check with the HJ. Just make sure they're comfortable with that. In my 30 plus years of doing this, I don't see many people using A8. Okay. I see them use all the others, but I don't really see them using A8 because it's hard to really tell what's in the ground, what's there. So it's probably not the, one of the popular ones. But we got other options. So if you look on the illustration here, you got item number one. So that is the metal underground water pipe, as you can see that running on the ground outside of the structure, um, 10 feet in, in, in the earth. Uh, if there's any break in that during that 10 foot period, like a meter, then you have to put a jumper over it to make it continuous. So you'll have to put a bonding jumper over it. Uh, and that bonding jumper will be sized based on the supply conductors to this building. Um, then the number two is, as you see here, it's the actual steel that goes down into the earth. It can be 10 foot in the uh, ground, or it can be encased in 10 feet in the concrete, okay? Uh, number three is a UFER. Like you say, in this case, it's showing the rebar, at least 20 feet of rebar, uh, and you make the connection to it. So as you can see here, uh, item number four is you can barely make it out, but that is a ground ring, and the ground ring has to encircle the entire building, and it doesn't have to be larger than a four, okay? So it circles the entire building. Uh, and then a four gauge copper. Next is number five, which is your rods and pipes, which is probably the most common is ground rods. So as you see number five here, so that'd be an eight foot ground rod. You drive it eight feet in the earth. You want to drive it to or below the surface. Now we're practical. You want to drive it below the frost line. Uh, but again, most of the time that's not practical. So most people don't do it. The key is at least needs to be driven down even with the earth or below the earth. Otherwise, if any of it's sticking up, one, you wouldn't have eight feet, and two, if it can be damaged, then you have to protect it, okay? So some people might say, well, I'm using a 10-foot ground rod. Well, if you're gonna leave two feet above the earth, uh, not only is that an impalement hazard, but it also means that something could damage the connector, uh, the acorn clamp, or whatever, and then you lose the integrity of the connection to earth, okay? for voltage stabilization, for lightning, transients, things like that. That's what it is, okay? Uh, and remember, the grounding electrode system that we're talking about in 250.50 and subsequently the different ones in 250.52 have absolutely nothing to do with clearing an overcurrent device. Let's get that straight, okay? Has nothing to do with that. This is all sizing the grounding electrode conductors from the panel down to the electrodes. All of this is based on 250.66, and of course, you have some allowances in 250.66 A, B, and C, which allow you to have specific sizes given in lieu of using the table in 250.66, okay? Whether you're dealing with rods or pipes, uh, things like that, a U for ground or ring, you have some allowances, okay? So just remember that. And I'm sure we're going to cover that as we go through this series again. Now, if you're in the grounding and bonding course, you're obviously going to cover that in detail. All right, so kind of gives you an idea what we got here. So here's the concrete and case electrode. Here's the ground ring. You see it wrapping around the building. Uh, here you got the water pipe ground. And of course, you have up to five feet of the point of entry is where you can bond the other electrodes together. This portion here. Uh, then you've got this one right here is, we didn't cover all of them. This is number six right here. This one is your other listed grounding electrode. Now, this is very, you know, this is one of those ones that's like the chemicals where you actually have access port and you pour the chemicals in it, it leaches out, and there's specific instruction for these. The problem with these is they have to be maintained. You really don't do nothing to ground rods. You don't do anything to the water pipe ground. You don't do anything to the plate uh, or the ground ring or even the concrete case lecture. But with these, you got to maintain them, right? So you have instructions from the manufacturer. You have to maintain it. Now, you sell the house, you go down, people don't know it's there, okay, then it could be a problem. But, you, but they do have to be maintained. And then, of course, number seven, as you can see right here, is a plate. 
and it's gotta be at least two square feet. So that's a one by one. That means it's one by one foot. So on both sides together would be two square feet in contact with the earth, okay? And it has to be on two and a half feet below the surface. So we're gonna cover all these nuances, but I always feel it's important for me because this video is not gonna cover every detail on those items. We're gonna do those in separate videos, but it's always important to me to throw you out some tidbits in case you don't go watch those other videos, right? I'm giving you a little bit of information that you can take away with you, okay? Okay. Okay, electrodes that are permitted for grounding. So we're kind of getting started into this. We, we looked at 250.50. It says that every electrode that's there has to be tied together to be a part of the grounding electrode system. So we kind of followed through that gives us, tells you what to do when the inherent ones aren't there, right? Like you don't have a water pipe ground, you don't have in-ground steel, and you don't have a UFO, which are inherent to the construction of the building uh, or something to do with construction. But you have the other options that you have to establish, okay? But there are certain electrodes that are permitted and certain that are not, okay? So let's look at the discussion here. Now, if you have your code book in 250.52a, you'll look at it, and A will start to give a list. You'll have an A1, an A2, an A3, an A4, and A5. And we're going to look at each one of these briefly, but in future videos, we're going to go deep in each one of them. And I'll have little stories and little tidbits and things to help you as we go. All right, so although the title of this section for electrodes are permitted uh, grounding, the use of these electrodes become mandatory because the language in 250.50 require all of these grounding electrodes to be bonded together to form the grounding electrode system. We established that. It says some electrodes, such as a metal water pipe, a metal underground water pipe, metal frames of the building or structure, and the concrete case electrodes are installed by trades other than electricians. So like we said, they are inherent. Well, we wouldn't do anything as an electrician. But if they're there, then we have to tie them together. And if it's there, we have to use it. We can't go to a building and it has a metal underground water pipe and we can't look at it and go, crap, there's too much I got to do with that. I have to supplement that per the code. I am just, I'll just ignore it. You can't ignore it. It's there, okay? Now it says, it used to say those that were available. And then it says those that are present. Well, it's present. It's there. You really have no choice, okay? All right. Also, it goes on to say their use as a grounding electrode became a gift to the electrical system installer. Yeah, because as an electrician, I didn't have to do nothing. Water pipe ground was there, or the in-ground steel was there due to construction, or the UFER was there. It ain't got nothing to do with me as an electrician, but it's there, so I'm going to use it, okay? Now, it says other electrodes such as ground rings, uh, round rods, pipes, electrodes, and plate electrodes commonly are installed by the electrician, 100%. Uh, used to be called man-made, uh, but we don't anymore. We just say, look, they're, they're other than the big three that are there inherent to construction. These are other ones that we have to install. So as an electrician, I got to go out and buy them and put them in, okay? The most common by far is ground rods. You know, so, again, nobody wants to dig the trenches. Nobody wants to lay a ground ring. I'm talking residential. You know, in, in some big buildings that are labs and hospitals, sometimes they will have the rings that have a more intricate grounding system. But residential, normal, yeah, we're not going to go through this ring stuff. We're not going to do all that. And if we're lucky, we have a UFER that we can utilize, okay? All right, now, it says, some installation requirements are contained in the description of the grounding electrodes, such as the minimum length of a water pipe, again, 10 feet in contact with the earth, or location of the concrete in case uh, electrode in not less than two inches of concrete. So it has to be in, and it needs to be a concrete in case electrode, whether it's the rebar or four gauge copper, has to be enveloped in at least two inches of concrete in the footing, right? That is in direct contact with the earth. That's key for a concrete case electrode because if there was a plastic barrier down or like a vapor barrier down where that footer was not directly in contact with the earth, then guess what? I don't have a UFER ground. I just have a structural reinforced steel and concrete for the building. But from the electrician's perspective, I can't use it because it's not in contact with the earth. So everywhere in the country is a little different. Some places don't require the vapor barrier. Some may. 
And some areas may require the vapor barrier, but might even allow the electrician to cut that vapor barrier in a small portion so that you do have at least that coverage area of the concrete 20 feet in contact with the earth, right? So everywhere is different. Check your local jurisdiction to see what they allow. But I can tell you, if you don't have the footer with the rebar, if that concrete that's enveloping or encasing that rebar, if that's not in contact with the earth, you don't have a UFO ground. And if you don't have a UFO ground, then it's not present. So you got to go some other direction, right? And that's where you would install 250.52, A4, A5, A6, or A7, whatever, to, to make up for that, okay? And most people are going to do ground rocks. It's going to be the simplest, simplest thing to do. All right, so in this video, we will cover a couple of them, not all of them, but we will cover a couple of them. So let's talk about the metal underground water pipe, and we're going to look at an illustration. And I will remind you that all of this is covered in extreme detail in our grounding and bonding course. I'm only giving you a sampling of what we cover, right? So let's talk about the underground metal water pipe. Now, a couple things. With today's construction and everything, the chances are you may not have a metal underground water pipe to be used as an electrode. Probably a good thing because you're going to have to supplement it anyway, okay? Um, but be careful because even if somebody tells you that you have a metal underground water pipe, it might be wrapped in a specific wrap and that metal water pipe is not literally in contact with the earth. If that's the case, it's not going to work. So it's really important. Now, if you're an electrician, you get in there late and somebody says, oh, yeah, it's got a water pipe ground. Well, your inspector could say, well, I didn't inspect it during the rough. And that's why AHJs and the inspectors, you know, I'm, I'm not a big believer in cross training, right? Whereas you have building inspectors doing electrical but I do believe that your AHJs, the building officials, they need to make sure that they have weekly training where they take the building inspectors, people that are going to go inspect the footers and, and before the pour of concrete and all this stuff. I think it behooves the AHJ to have some training. Now, when I was ahead of the inspectors in the city of Alexandria, Virginia, way back many moons ago, we had training every week. And that was because I wanted to be able to say, you know what, when the building inspector goes out there to look at footers or the footings or something like that, or the plumber goes out and looked at the water line connections, when it, I want them to mark somewhere in their notes that they verified this, okay, in case it comes up later. So to me, it was just an educational thing. I wanted to get them. Now, I would say they need a checklist, because building guys aren't really very well versed in electrical. So we want to make it those simple things easy for them. So I would, a short little small little checklist that we used to have, and would be, you could laminate it and they would keep it on a clipboard, things to look at. And in the permit system, it would say, a note would say something like, check your grounding and bonding a, a pamphlet or a card or whatever. And it would remind them to check for certain things. Um, every jurisdiction is different, but again, it does save a bunch of headache down the road because if you come down for the rough end and somebody says it's a water pipe ground, but the inspector can't verify it, then he's going to say it doesn't exist. I can't verify it. For all I know, it's plastic. Or all I know, it's wrapped in a, a, a protective layer that is non-conductive. Or they don't know. So they're going to make you. Now, because of that, you are required to supplement the water pipe anyway. So if you have a metal underground water pipe system, somebody could replace it. So down the road, what's going to happen is I need to make sure that I have another electrode system established and they're tied together. So that if something happens and the water pipe ground is removed or they change a section of it or do something with it, I've still got a grounding electrode system intact. Now, the reason they do that for the water pipe, because that is commonly changed, whereas the other electrodes are not. Ground rods, once they're driven due to suction, they're not coming out, okay? So, I mean, I guess they could come out, but who, 
Who's stupid enough to do that? So you've got the rings stay in the ground, plates stay in the ground, rods stay in the ground, you first part of the construction, in-ground steel is part of the... But with the water pipe, it's very common for them to bust or ground heave and crack and somebody go in and fix them. We don't want to lose the integrity of our grounding electrode system. So they are required to be supplemented. So let's look at the requirements real quick for a metal underground water pipe, and we'll at least knock out 250.52A1 in this episode. The requirements, it says, a metal underground water pipe is required to be used as a grounding electrode if it is in direct contact with the earth for 10 feet or more. Now, including any metal well casing, you make sure that, or piping, or any type of filter system or anything, maybe a utility meter, you have to bond around that to make it continuous for 10 feet, okay? Right? So we, the whole purpose here is I need 10 feet of continuous, okay? So if you've got your code book, I'll read from the code, even though it's still up on the screen. It says, a metal underground water pipe in direct contact with the earth for 10 feet or more, including any metal well casing bonded to the pipe, and electrically continuous. Notice it says, and electrically continuous. So here's a little thing about code. When you see or and ands, the or means you do this or that. The and means you have to maintain this and you have to do that, okay? So it's got to be 10 feet, direct contact with the earth. And if you have any metal casings or anything that you might need to jump or over it, you got to do that. It's got to be continuous. So that 10 feet, if you put a meter in it in the middle, then it's 5 feet and 5 feet. That's not continuous. If that meter can be removed, then you would, you're not going to have 10 feet. But if you jump or around it, then it's basically just a continuation, okay? So that needs to be in place. You need to make sure that's there, all right? And then it goes on to say, to the points of connection to the grounding electrical conductor and the bonding conductors, okay? So in the earth, discussion. It says, this section describes grounding electrodes that are required to be used if present at the building. Now, remember, you say if available. Now it's for the last couple cycles, it says that are present. If it's there, it's present. Now, I will tell you this. If my water pipe ground is wrapped with a protective tape or a protective barrier uh, and it's not in contact with the earth, then it is not present. Yes, it's a water pipe. Yes, it might be metal. But if it's not in direct contact with the earth due to the nature of its installation, then it is not present. The problem is, how do you know that as an electrician? You come in late to the game. It doesn't really matter because we're going to have to supplement it anyway. So, again, it pretty much takes care of itself. Right now, it goes on to say underground metal water pipe has been required to be used as a grounding electrode for many additions at NEC way back. Okay, even before any of the other electrodes were really in there, this was required to use the water pipe. Okay, the rule applies whether the metal underground water pipe is a part of a public or community water distribution system, it's not going to matter. We're not even talking about the flow of water here. We're talking about utilizing it as an electrode and the amount that has to be in contact with the earth, 10 feet, okay, or more. Could be more than 10 feet, but at least 10 feet. Um, it says, or is from a well on the premise. It wouldn't matter, okay? It's still water. It's still a water pipe, okay? It's an underground water pipe. Then it would be required to be utilized if it was there. Okay, so let's kind of look at an illustration because you know what? Pictures worth a thousand words always is. So let's kind of look at this illustration here. So as you can see in this illustration, you've got the water pipe coming in, and I'll kind of I'll kind of flow over it with my mouse here. You got the water coming in. So here's 10 feet in earth right here. But this would break it up. If you did not have this jumper, then it wouldn't be continuous. Okay. And this is for servicing. All right, a removal. So what we have to do is put this jumper on it. And it has to be long enough that it will not inhibit the removal of whatever it's jumping over. So the bonding jumper has to be long enough to be able to service this meter, okay? So, okay, without having to remove this jumper. I don't need to take off the jumper to get the meter out if I'm servicing it or something like that. It's kind of foolish, right? So it's got to be long enough, adequate, Typically with these, what we've done is we go over it, but we turn it to the side so it's basically going around 
instead of over. It doesn't really matter. Semantics either way. But there has been occasions where there is loose neutral connections in a building, and they go to change this meter, and you actually, with no jumper, and they pull it out, you see some arcing take place. Okay? So, again, that's a whole different story, but we want to make sure that bonding jumper is there. We have to maintain the integrity, 10 feet or more in contact with the earth. That's critical to this electrode. Again, if it's wrapped in something and it is not in contact with the earth, then I would argue it's not present. Okay? Now... I will tell you this, if it's not present, then it's not there, then that means this five feet point of entry is not there. You with me? That's my opinion, okay? So, uh, you know, you can agree to disagree with that, uh, but if the electrode doesn't exist, okay, why do I say that? Because if you go to 250.68C1, and I'm gonna do it, let's do it together. Uh, I'll go to 250.68, 64, hopefully you got your code books with you. Okay, 68, so it tells me C1. So C1, it says grounding electric conductor connections. And here you see it says the interior metal water piping that is electrically continuous with a metal underground water pipe electrode. I don't know, if there's not an underground water pipe electrode, then... Do I really have that? No. Okay. So just things to think about. All right. Anyway. Um, so here you got a bunch of other information that is available uh, in the program as well. But uh, again, so there we are at the first one, which is the A1. Okay. All right. So, all right. And so. What we're going to do is we're going to actually, at A1, we're going to end it there. Okay. So that was a pretty good video. We, we covered a lot of things here. We even dabbled into the first electrode, right? And, uh, hey, I think it's important that we really focus on the grounding and bonding, and the grounding electrode system is a vital thing that we have to always start out with and understand. And we need to understand all the electrodes that are associated with it as well, right? So hopefully you got something out of today's video. And uh, we will catch you in the next video where we'll be talking about other grounding electrodes. Till next time, stay safe.